lesson number four, demo. In this class, we define the derivative as the slope of a tangent line. We also extend instantaneous velocity to the more general instantaneous rate of change. But first, let's spend about 10 minutes talking about a way to visualize with hearts some parts of the arbitrating dispute uh, disputes project. So uh, let's take a look at some of the data up here. Uh, we've got the letter u representing a function. And the first row, it's all u sub e. And uh, the second row is all u sub f. So let's make sure we're clear on what these things mean. So this first row, the e stands for Ellen. That's one of our participants. And in the second row, uh, the f stands for Frank. That's the other person. And as you recall from the project, Ellen and Frank are trying to decide where they should go on vacation. Their options are the beach, uh, the mountains, or staying home. And so we've asked Ellen and Frank to rate uh, these three outcomes uh, in terms of uh, their utility. That's what the U stands for. And utility, uh, from an economics perspective, means usefulness. And in this case, usefulness is really happiness. Uh, each of these folks wants to go to a place that's going to make them the most happy. And I like having units on my numbers, and so my happiness units here are hearts. And so, for example, uh, if I focus on this one right here, this says U sub E of M. That means Ellen's utility, Ellen's happiness for going to the mountains is three. Three what? Well, I'm just going to call it three hearts. If you let her go to the mountains, she gains three hearts of happiness. If we uh, do the status quo, which means stay home, then Ellen has zero hearts of happiness. She's not extra happy or extra sad. It's just the status quo, just things as usual. In fact, uh, by this point in the project, we have intentionally shifted both of their utility functions to make them agree at the status quo. We shifted them both to get them to be zero for staying home. And uh, poor Ellen, if you make her go to the beach, has a negative one heart's worth of happiness. She's actually sad if you make her go to the beach. Uh, you know, she's got to deal with like suntan and little kids and, and you could get sand up all in your bathing suit. And nobody wants that. Um, so she would rather stay home than go to the beach. But anyway, she might be forced to go to the beach depending on how this plays out. And then the same deal here for Frank. Um, Frank uh, really loves the beach. He gets seven hearts worth of happiness for the beach. We have redefined his status quo to be zero hearts. Uh, but Frank does not like the mountains. Uh, you got mosquitoes to contend with, and you could get lost, and there are bears, and then you got to filter the water in the stream. It's just a mess. Who wants to go to the mountains? Uh, and so the problem here is that, as we can see, uh, Ellen really wants to go to the mountains, and Frank doesn't. Uh, but Frank really wants to go to the beach, and Ellen doesn't. And so we're trying to come up with some fair way to decide what to do. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture here. I'm going to focus first on this point labeled M. The coordinates of this point right here are 3 and negative 1. Let's make sure we understand what that point represents. This M is the mountain point, and that 3 is Ellen's happiness number, and that negative 1 is Frank's happiness number. And so that point right there is just the physical representation of the mountain for both Ellen and Frank. So that point is not Ellen, and that point is not Frank. That point is mountain. And Ellen is always going to be the first coordinate, and Frank is always going to be the second coordinate. Let's take a look at this point up here labeled B for beach. So the coordinates of this point are negative 1, 7. That is not an Ellen point or a Frank point. That is a beach point. And again, Ellen is always the first number, and Frank is always second. Uh, and then uh, just for kicks, we can also label the last point status quo right there. That's a zero for Ellen and a zero for Frank for staying home. Okay, so we could just say, um, hey, we're going to go to uh, the mountains and uh, Frank is going to have to suck it up. Or we're just going to go to the beach and Ellen is just going to have to suck it up. Or uh, we could just flip a coin, right? And just say like half the time we're going to go to the beach and half the time we're going to go to the mountains. But the problem with flipping a coin is that flipping a coin does not take into account the strengths of Ellen and Frank's preferences. Um, so we know that Ellen uh, has given a three to going to the mountains and Frank has given a seven to going to the beach. So like who feels more passionately about going to their preferred destination? Well, it's Frank, right? Frank feels twice as strongly, um, more than twice as strongly um, about going to uh, the 
speech over um, um, Ellen's preference for the mountains. And so that doesn't mean we're just going to go to the beach every time, but we should take into account the strengths of these folks' preferences. So um, we could just flip a coin and half the time beach and half the time um, mountains, but we're going to do a more complicated lottery. I'm just going to make a lottery up right now. Let's suppose that we go, uh, we do the uh, status quo. So we've got status quo there and we've got mountains and we've got beach. And suppose that we do the status quo um, one tenth of the time. So it's not flipping a coin, but it's a tenth of the time. And suppose that we do the mountains two tenths. Uh, let's do the mountains seven tenths of the time. And therefore the beach, well, we've got it. There's only one number that can be over here, right? Like in part of your project, one of the problems involves the fact that these three things, these three numbers have to add up to one because we got to do something. 100% of the time, we've got to do one of these things. So I guess that leaves two tenths of the time right there. Okay, um, so I've just made those numbers up, but let's see if we can calculate how happy Ellen is going to be with this lottery. Uh, I'll put some commas here to distinguish. Okay, so just a totally made up lottery, and let's take a look at Ellen's happiness. Okay. So uh, we're going to skip the status quo for a second, but let's look at the mountains. Seven tenths of the time we're going to the mountains, and how happy is Ellen whenever she gets to go to the mountains? In terms of happiness, she has uh, three hearts coming her way, right? And I'm going to multiply these two things together. Seven tenths of the time she gets three hearts, and then two tenths of the time she goes to the beach, and I'm going to multiply by her beach happiness, which is negative one hearts. And then it's actually not going to matter, but I should put one tenth of the time times the status quo number. And the status quo is zero, so one tenth of zero doesn't contribute anything. And we're going to add up these three different numbers here. So we multiply the probability times the number of hearts, the utility function. And then we add up these three. Um, these are actually number of hearts that Ellen can expect to come her way. And so we add these things up. And so if we add these things up, uh, we get uh, 21 minus 2, that's 19 over 10, which is 1.9, and the unit still here is hearts. So what does this mean? Well, um, can Ellen ever get 1.9 hearts for one of these three locations? Well, if she goes to the mountains, she gets three hearts. If she goes to the beach, she loses a heart, and if she stays home, she gets zero hearts. 1.9 is not one of the allowable outcomes. But if we do this lottery, like a hundred times, a couple thousand times, on average, Ellen would expect to get 1.9 hearts of happiness. She'd never get that on one particular trip, but on average, over the long run, she would expect to get 1.9 hearts worth of happiness, uh, according to this lottery. And let's do the same thing for Frank. And so we're going to do one-tenth of Frank's status quo, which is zero, plus seven-tenths of Frank's mountain, which is a negative one heart plus two-tenths of Frank's beach number, which is seven hearts. So 14 minus seven, I get seven over 10. Point seven hearts. And so if we do this particular lottery in the long run, Ellen expects 1.9 hearts for every trip, and Frank expects 0.7 hearts for every trip. And we are trying to somehow um, maximize the joint happiness of these two folks. Now, uh, at this point in the project, you don't have yet a, a function that represents the joint happiness. But for example, you could add up the two hearts, um, uh, you know, 0.7 and 1.9, and, and we get 2.6 hearts jointly for the two of them. And you could look at all the different possible lotteries, not just the one that I picked here in black, but any possible lottery. And you could find the one that maximizes the sum of their hearts. In this case, it's 2.6, but maybe another lottery would get something bigger than 2.6. Um, so I'm not saying that's the function that we're trying to maximize, but that's the idea, is that soon enough in the project, you'll have a function that you are trying to maximize. It will represent their joint happiness in a fair way. Uh, I also want to point out uh, that this point, let's graph this point right here. Uh, so we came up with the point, Ellen's number is always first, remember, and it's 1.9 and then 0.7. So 1.9 and then 0.7 is roughly here. 1.9 comma 0.7 with Ellen first and Frank second as usual. And I will say that that point is very much a weighted average of the three corners of our triangle. Our triangle has those three vertices, 
And this point right here, the one that we just plopped down right there, is a weighted average. It is one-tenth of the status quo, which means it is pulled towards the status quo one-tenth, which actually isn't very much, which makes sense. Like you can see that the point that we plotted there is really close to this long diagonal line because it's only pulled one-tenth of the way towards the status quo point, the origin. And now is this point right here, is it closer to the beach or is it closer to the mountains? Well, it's much closer to the mountains. Does that make sense? Yeah, the mountains got seven tenths of the weight and the beach only got two tenths of the weight. And so this point here is literally pulled seven tenths towards that point and only two tenths towards that point. And every point in and on that triangle corresponds to some lottery. Um, and, uh, and I think one of the early problems in your project says, take a look at the point uh, two and a half comma zero which is this point right here. And it asks you to figure out the lottery that goes with that point. Uh, sorry, that is not two and a half zero. Let's try this again. Two and a half zero is this one. And the question asks you to find the lottery, meaning find the probabilities that correspond to this point right here, two and a half comma zero. And so that's just going the other direction, right? In this case, we started with the probabilities and we came up with the coordinates of the point. In the project, you're given the coordinates of the coordinates of the point, and you're going to come up with the fractions for the lottery. Okay, so that's all we have to say about the lottery. Uh, sorry about the uh, project number one. Let's move on to the the new stuff. Number one, everything we've done with velocities over the last few classes can be applied to arbitrary functions, not just to height or distance functions. For a general function, average velocity becomes average rate of change and instantaneous velocity becomes instantaneous rate of change. Thus, the instantaneous rate of change of y equals f of t at t equals a is given by limit as h goes to zero f of a plus h minus f of a over h. We actually saw exactly this formula a couple of classes ago. Um, when we were uh, dropping things off of the CN tower. Uh, but now, instead of just saying instantaneous velocity, we're generalizing to instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so here's the, um, here's the graph that we, uh, we had when we were dropping things off that CN tower. And we had the fixed point up there in red and then the varying point down there in green. And uh, we know that the... Um, what do we know? We know that the uh, average velocity is the slope of a secant line. And we were interested in taking that varying point and plopping it very, very close to the fixed point. So we're going to take this varying point and we're going to slide it up the curve until it lands pretty much smack dab on top of the fixed point. And at that one moment where it lands on top, the secant line becomes a tangent line. And so what we were interested in was just the slope of that tangent line. So the instantaneous velocity is the slope of the tangent line. And then the slope of a tangent line is just the change in y over change in x. So it's just the function, which is now called f, not s. So it's the function uh, at the green point minus the function at the red point divided by the input values at those two points. And so on the bottom, we get nice cancellation. So it's just an H down there, and I should have put a limit because we want to send H towards a particular number. I'll squeeze it in here, a limit as H approaches. And so in order to get the um, uh, varying point to slide up this curve, what happens to H, which is always this distance? It heads towards zero, and so that's what we're interested in. And that's why um, this is the definition of instantaneous rate of change uh, just up above here. So this thing agrees with what we just wrote down. It's just the slope of a tangent line, nothing more. Okay, number two, the population f of t of China in billions can be approximated by f of t equals 1.267 times 1.007 to the t, where t is the number of years since the start of 2000. First, what kind of a function is f of t equals 1.267 times 1.007 to the t? This is an exponential function. And let's get one more word in here. Is this exponential growth or decay? This is a growth function because the 1.007 is bigger than 1. Uh, 
Okay, what is the growth rate as a percentage? So the growth rate, um, remember the growth rate is really just the R value inside the parentheses. And so um, one plus the growth rate is 1.007. So that means that the rate is 0 0.007, which as a percentage is 0.7%. So 0.7% per year, that is the rate of growth of this population. What does the model predict for the population at the start of this year, at the start of the coming year? Um, so depending on when you watch this, the answer is going to change, but uh, the population at the start of 2018 uh, just means plugging 18 in um, for the value of T. So 1.267 times 1.007 to the 18. So let's grab that on the calculator. And just while we're here, the start of the coming year, as of the recording this video, that's 2019. So I got that number. I think these are in billions of people. Okay, here we go. Uh, so 1.4365, something like that. And then the other number, F19, is roughly 1.4465. Okay, so it says, what's the growth rate at the start of this year as an absolute amount? Said another way, estimate how fast the population is growing at the start of this year. Rounding is a bad idea. Um, okay, so uh, the growth rate at the start of this year is an absolute amount. Okay, so um, as an absolute amount, we're looking for how many people were, um, like by, by what number of people did the population change at the start of this year at that one moment in time. So if I wanted to look, for example, uh, I'm just going to call it rate of change, ROC for rate of change, uh, between uh, 2018 and 2019. Well, that's easy, right? I, I have the two numbers here. I've got the 1.4465 billion people, subtract the 1.4365 billion people. I'm going to go ahead and divide by one, it's silly to write down because it's just one year that's happened, but I'm interested in billions of people per year, so it feels like I should be dividing by the number of years that have elapsed. So rounding, it says, is a bad idea, so I guess we should probably do something a little bit fancier so we can store these numbers here on the calculator. Um, so we're going to store uh, this number that we just came up with as x, and then I'm going to go back, second enter a few times, and then store the other number as a, I guess. Okay, so we're going to store this thing as alpha A. Okay, so A is the is the 2018 number. And so I think this is really just X minus A. So X minus A. And then we divide that by 1. So we get this many billions of people. 0.0100 and then a bunch of fives. This is billions of people per year. But that's looking at the rate of change, the average rate of change, average rate of change, over the course of an entire year. And the population was increasing maybe faster and faster over the course of that entire year. So maybe looking from 2018 to 2019, the whole year's worth of time is, is just too big of a, a thing to look for. So how about instead? And look at the average rate of change between the start of 2018 and a tenth of a year into 2018. And so let's do this calculation here. Uh, so this is f of 18.1 minus f of 18, all divided by 18.1 minus 18, which looks an awful lot like stuff we've seen before. Again, this is called the difference quotient. And so given that I'm using this function notation anyway, I feel like I should stop storing things and rather just type the function in here. I think that would be the easiest thing to do. So where's our function? 
So 1.267 times 1.007 to the x rate. And so then if I quit out of here, and then we just start typing like this version of things, it should give it to us in one shot. Remember, we need extra parentheses here. So uh, the function at 18.1 minus the function at 18. Close the top parentheses divided by, and then this is kind of silly, it's just 0.1, but I'll put 18.1 minus 18. And this gives us a more accurate answer than the one from before. So this is around um, 0 0.010024. I think I've got that right. That looks good. Billions of people per year. OK, let's try one more time. Uh, we'll get even um, closer to 18 right now. So the last one, average rate of change between 18 and 18 point, I don't know, let's do 18.001. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and type this on the calculator. We just do a second entry and then edit. So we're trying to insert two zeros here. And the same thing up here. That moment right there where we just do the easy editing is why it's useful to type this into the y equals part. OK, 02054. Let's see if we got that. I think that looks good. Okay, so our estimate for the rate at which the population was changing at the start of 2018 is this. So 0.01 billion people per year, which is roughly 10 million people per year. What's the relationship between the answers to D and E? So that's our final answer for E and our answer for D uh, says, what did the population predict for uh, the start of this year and the start of the coming year? Um, so the, what we're predicting here is that um, we're gaining about 10 million people from 2018 to 2019. So was that the reality? Uh, so let's take a look here. Did we gain about 10 million people going from here to here? Well, we did, yeah. We went from the, that three to this four, and that is... 10 million people, because these are billions of people numbers here. So our final answer here is an estimate uh, for what's going to happen over the course of the entirety of 2018. Um, but know that our answer right there is really just what's happening at the start of 2018. And, and two months into 2018, it's going to be a different number and a different calculation. The analog here is if I told you that I was driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour at this one moment, like right now, I'm driving 60 miles an hour. Can you guarantee that an hour from now I will be 60 miles away? And the answer is no, because my speed could change over the course of that hour, right? I could, I could go faster, I could stop, um, I could get to my destination. So uh, this is just like saying at this one moment in time, at the start of 2018, we're gaining about 10 million people per year. But that changes two months into 2018. In fact, it changes a second into 2018. Um, so it's dangerous to predict for too long of a time period. OK, number three, uh, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h, that's the thing we saw at the start on the previous page, is called the derivative of the function f at x equals a. Note that the independent variable will usually be x, so we'll generally use x instead of t. It is denoted by f, and then there's an apostrophe with an a in parentheses, and it is read f prime of a. So to summarize, here's our most important definition of the entire semester. The derivative of f at x equals a is f prime of a equals, and then that whole limit of the difference quotient. So the derivative is just the instantaneous rate of change, which we knew is the slope of the tangent line. 
Number four, finding the derivative of a function is known as differentiating the function. If a function has a derivative, the function is called differentiable. All these phrases are important and they will hopefully become second nature to you soon enough. As we've seen, the average rate of change of a function, which is that fraction, is the slope of a secant line. And as h goes to zero, we know that the secant line becomes the tangent line. So number six, so let's have a geometrical um, look at the derivative on another geometer sketch pad thing. Okay, so here's uh, the graph of the function pi times x squared. And I've got my special point right now, which is the moment is right around x equals two, that's here. Um, and then I've got a, a lemming point, which I can move any place I want to. And um, so at this particular moment, uh, the lemming point is over here and the special point is way over here. And the slope of that line, that secant line is currently negative 11.6. But I'm interested in the derivative at this point. And the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. So what I'd really like to do is take this lemming point and move it so that it is pretty much smack dab on top of the special point. This is still a secant line, but it is heading towards the tangent line. And so roughly uh, the slope of this now tangent line is about 12.6. And so what we are saying is that the derivative of that function at x equals two is 12.61. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line. Okay, suppose that I were to move my special point from x equals two to x equals three. Do we expect, so now I'm up here at x equals three, do we expect the tangent line to be uh, have a bigger or smaller slope than it did before? So right here, the tangent line at x equals two, and now we're gonna do a tangent line at x equals three. Well, this graph is uh, not only increasing, but it's increasing faster and faster. And so I expect this tangent line here to be steeper than it was before. The slope is now roughly 18.8. It used to be something like 12.61. So it makes sense that it's gotten bigger. Uh, let's come way out here to roughly x equals six. I'm gonna send the lemming right over to the special point, 37.6. That is a very steep tangent line there. That makes sense. Let's take a look at the tangent line at the bottom. So you should be able to predict uh, what the slope is of this tangent line right down here at the bottom. So the tangent line at the bottom is perfectly horizontal. So this should be perfectly zero. How come it's not perfectly zero? Well, I didn't quite hit x equals zero. We were close. Uh, and then we'll just do um, one more out here at uh, something negative. How about this one? Um, actually, let's do a different one. There's negative six. So what kind of a, uh, sorry, negative seven. So what kind of a tangent line do we have out here? Well, the tangent line here is going to be moving downhill. So I expect to see a negative value of the slope a negative derivative in this case, right around negative 44. Okay, this next statement is super important. The derivative of a function at a point is the slope of the tangent line at that point. Here's the Cliff Notes version. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line. 